ladies, I've heard you both use the term fresh eyes, and I'm wondering what that means in relation to documentary filmmaking and how important that is. Well, we try to we we try to make our films always with fresh eyes. If we can't get fresh eyes on a film, we probably won't make it, which means that we want to um, take on subjects that are deeply interesting to us, we're fascinated by, um, that we don't feel like we know everything about. So we're, it starts with a really deep curiosity. And we have to go in just asking questions, not with an agenda. Uh, and so that's what we mean by fresh eyes, just sort of a brand new perspective. We're listening to what you have to say. We're not t taking any position or judging necessarily. We just want to hear what a character has to say or what a story is. So that's what we mean by fresh eyes. I was thinking it meant more that you had feedback on a rough cut or something. So no, it means more as it pertains to you both, fresh mm -hmm. eyes in terms of your curiosity, not right. how someone's receiving your rough cut of something. Another, uh, yes. Oh yes, of course. Well, we yeah. do want fresh eyes on on that too, because you do lose perspective when you're editing. So yes, we we like other people's fresh eyes on our work and to give us feedback. But um, what Heidi's describing is also you can call it the beginner's mind, which is when you um, when you have no idea what someone's answer is going to be, and you should always kind of be in that place, especially at the beginning of a project. If you already know what people are going to say you're going to get sick of it. You're going to, you're going to peter out on the subject matter. So that's why you want to have the beginner's mind. And if you can maintain it for a while, you're going to enjoy making this film. You're going to be curious enough to, you know, keep the momentum. Going back to curiosity, which is more crucial, an interesting topic, but a reluctant or maybe not fully developed subject for whatever reason, or the reverse? a fascinating person, but a topic that's maybe more vague and a little bit too broad. Well, we don't make films about topics. We're very careful not to come up with a topic and then try to back into it. Um, but it's, it's important to have subject matter that is rich and has depth that is, could be full of surprises and twists and turns, but it doesn't matter if you have that in-depth topic if you don't have amazing characters to take you on the journey. So really, we look for both. We look for a subject matter that hasn't been picked over so many times that people think that they know that much about it. Um, and you also need these great storytellers, which is part of our casting process, is to find those who can articulate a journey or, or can change over the course of a film and can bring a subject matter to life. I think it would be almost a Venn diagram, actually, when you put it that way, which is if there are both, we make a movie about it. And it's, it's hard to have both. It's, it's unusual, which is why we make a film every couple of years or so, because they don't come along every minute. How far into the process of a film do you know if the subject is working? I know you talked about, Heidi, I think with Boys of Baraka, that you had one subject that seemed more reluctant, but that person was so fascinating that you really wanted to keep up with it. Yeah, it and was I a know mistake. That, okay, so, so and, and, and I'm sure that was a painful mistake because you probably really wanted that person in the film. Very much, Dewan, the one that got away. Um, we have learned over a long career that reluctant subjects are no subjects at all. A reluctant subject, it only exists in your mind. He or she will never participate uh, or uh, allow you the access that we need uh, in order to make a satisfying film. So we detect very early on by doing test shoots and allowing people to, saying, listen, let's come into your house, let's shoot a little bit, see how it feels for both of us. Because a reluctant or a subject that's too shy, a camera shy or too self-conscious probably won't get over that. And so you have to move on. And it can be very, very painful. And we don't really make that mistake too much anymore. Um, on this film, we did film several people before we settled on our final three. And one was a reluctant subject <laughs> that we spent a couple of too many days on, maybe, um, thinking that he might come around. But he did not. So you keep, ma you keep making those stumbles. Hopefully, you spend less and less time on the reluctant subject every film. Right. Well, the three interviews that you have, um, for lack of a better word, subjects, are all fascinating. Uh, Loser, Ari, and Eddie. Uh, and they're, each one of their stories are, are so amazing. I, I want to know, did uh, your angel investor broach the idea for 
approaching footsteps or no, was, not at all. Oh, wasn't okay. Mm -mm. So I'm, how did you know about the angel investor? Uh, you did a TIFF interview. It was on stage and you talked about Oh yeah, about, it's great. I just, you're oh. very observant. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's one of my faults too. No, it's, she's wonderful <laughs> and her, and she's, no, uh, you know what? We were already working on it. Okay. And, um, that's another sign that we really want to do something, which is when we just start working on something with no funding whatsoever and um, figure out, you know, use all of our own resources. And usually when we do that, it works out. Once in a while we've had some duds, but um, typically if we're as excited, if we're excited enough that we have as a subject, a character and some passion, it happens. So we, that's, we have a fairly good record of that. And in this case, we had just started um, fishing around and trying to figure out what our story was and casting a bit. And um, this a wonderful woman, Regina Scully, gave us our seed money. Okay. So what was the impetus for the idea, though? I mean, you both live in New York City or, or on the outskirts. Did you see members of the Hasidic community walking around and just you were so intrigued by them as all we of all our, are? All of our films begin with a deep curiosity for a particular, particular, particular subject or an obsession in this case. Um, Rachel lives in Brooklyn adjacent to a, a Hasidic community. I live in an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood in lower Manhattan. And so the two of us have a lot of, just had a lot of interactions, small interactions every day with the Hasidic community. But if you live in New York, you ride the subway with them. You might live next door. You might, you know, during the high holidays, see them in mass, um, you know, on the street at a f street celebration. If you're in New York with eyes, you, are, you, you see the Hasidic community, but you don't know anyone. You don't have any Hasidic friends. You have usually no exchanges with Hasidic people. Um, usually there's not eye contact even. So it's this population that lives among us. We live among their population but there's zero contact and that is so unusual and so strange because you know this is not like filming the Amish um, you know this is not a remote area this is the largest city in America and here we are um, next to each other not speaking so for Rachel and I there was always a very deep sense of curiosity and fascination but we never would dare to try to make a film about the community because we're two secular women this is a community that does not want to be photographed that is very um, has an aversion to publicity um, doesn't watch film or television is not looking for any sort of attention so we we, we just just you know we had a fascination that we let let stand then we read about Footsteps, an organization that helps people exit the community, that's sort of the underground railroad of people that are trying to transition into a more secular life. And we thought that might be an interesting jumping off point to get to know the community and those people that are brave enough um, to try and get try to leave it. And so that really was our access point. We thought if we could get access to Footsteps, maybe there's a movie here. Uh, and that took about a year to get access and to start finding our subjects. And it turned out to be true because through our subjects, you do get a real sense of the Hasidic community, even without official access. In the beginning of your filmmaking, how fearful or brave were you to ask for more? The beginning of our career? Mm -hmm. huh. Ask for more from money, our <laughs> subjects, or money, or everything. Any of it? Everything. I know you had talked about in an interview confidence uh -huh. and versus being afraid to ask for more. Right. And that really, I was like a light bulb went off because, uh -huh. not even gender specific, but just just the fear of appearing too, you know, whatever pushy. It, pushy or, it is gender specific. Uh, is it okay? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. But but, it but is getting over specific. that, and I think you talked about how you didn't even realize that was a thing, and you just kept, you were okay with asking for more, and I'd love to hear more about that. I think, I mean, I, I think a lot of women, um, professional women, have that kind of trajectory, which is, um, you know, as you have more success and you have more personal confidence, you will ask for more. And we, we, we're two women, we own our own company, we have staff, and we've noticed over the years that the, the boy, our boy employees will always ask for more, even if they don't deserve it. And the, and the women won't. So um, I think part of, it's just, you know, we also, we, we matured and we got more confident, but also we were business owners. And I think you start seeing the world differently when you are asking for money, when you're taking care of money, when you have staff working for you, when you're a director, you're telling people what your vision is and expecting them to, um, they work for you. So all of the things that help people get more confident and ask for more, we were put in a position that we were able to grow in it. 
Um, so now that we're almost 30, we're insanely confident. <laughs> Great. Uh, we, um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a privilege, it's a privilege to make documentary films. It's a privilege to be in this business and direct. Um, but there's also a marketplace for the stories we have to tell. There is more of a marketplace than there's ever been. And so I think a lot of filmmakers, especially earlier in their career, just feel so lucky that anyone is interested in financing their work or supporting their work. And I totally understand that. But I think it's really important to graduate into a place where you realize that everyone is, is moved by important stories well told. And it's very hard to tell a story, an important story, well. And so there is a premium for those people that can do it. And it's important to realize that, especially as a woman director, uh, because if you don't ask, it will not be offered to you. So you have to know that and sort of, you know, make demands that are reasonable, that are fair, and so you don't just uh, end up, um, you know, working for less or, or um, feeling less than. So we, we, we can't, we, that happened pretty early on in our career. I mean, we put our heads down and we work and we make a movie. That's what we do. Uh, but we also know that this is important work that, that people want to see and will and we'll pay for and that sort of thing. So it's really find, finding that balance between doing subjects that really interest us and also realizing that it is a business as well. So then asking for more, being given somewhat access to footsteps, I think you had said maybe that they let you sort of be in the lobby for a little bit. It was like sort of baby steps with them. And no, I, I mean, that, that was the access that they gave us. That was it. Yes. Okay. They, they, they gave us the ability to meet their clients. That's what we were asking them for. We did not film inside Footsteps hardly ever, except a couple of one-on-one -on -one sessions, which you see in the movie. Right, and they're excellent, by the way. Oh, thank but, you. Yeah. Those were hard-fought scenes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Those were hard to get, very, very hard to get. I can uh, see why. Yeah. So we weren't, at, we weren't asking them for more. That's all we needed from them. So um, we were very persistent and patient and, um, you know, gave them a good pitch of why we were the right people for them to trust, and they did it. And then um, we met their members, and we kept our end of the bargain, and we made a movie that they like, and they can use in any way they want. Um, so we, we, all, we all got something out of it, which is another thing that you understand as you get more seasoned, that everyone is doing something for their own incentive, and you have to figure out what that incentive is. And also in terms of asking for more, I mean, they had been contacted by other filmmakers, multiple filmmakers over the years, and they had said no. And so we said, but you haven't been contacted by us. <laughs> and we have a body of work to show. So it's not abstract so much. They could see all of our past films are five plus feature length documentaries plus a lot of their work, and they can judge for themselves, you know, how big of a risk is this? Footsteps took a big risk. They had no editorial control over the film. They were not invited for any editorial feedback. And so they had to trust that at least these filmmakers didn't have a specific agenda and would tell it like it is, which is all we can guarantee. Uh, and so they kind of jumped off a cliff as well. And, you know, that's what it takes. It's like it takes really, really brave individuals that will trust you and organizations in order for this documentary thing to even happen. And we rely on, on people to trust us and we rely on goodwill. And we take it as a big responsibility and as, as a big gift. And it can be a heavy burden because people have trusted you and entrusted you with their secrets and their stories. And so um, that has not gotten easier. That is just, you know, something that we grapple with every time. Are we doing right by this person? Um, is this, did this person mean to say that? Or is this the one day that they would say such a crazy thing that would be great in the movie, but they actually don't really mean it? So you have to sort of also suss out, you know, what, what is representative of a person or an organization. So, so that, we, we had a lot of those sort of, um, you know, we had to grapple with a lot of those sort of rocky moments on this particular movie. And in following the three, uh, Ari, Loser, and Eddie, how long were you filming them? Because I saw such an arc in how they changed. I was, it was almost like they were different people by the mm. end of the film, from my eyes. I don't know if that was really the way it was, but from the first uh, initial sort of scenes with them to the end, I felt they were different people. So we how we filmed with them for about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah, in and out over a year and a half. But they, you know, were all in New York. 
So we, ha we had a very luxurious opportunity where we could pop in when we wanted and it wasn't not like a huge big deal to go and shoot for you know three hours with one of them so that was a real bonus i don't think a non-new yorker could have made this film you had you had to be living in new york city to make at least a film that we made so you do have an excellent body of work and that's probably one of the reasons that footsteps you know they, they saw your track record they saw that you had not only excellent films but films that had a broad audience um, most documentary filmmakers don't get sort of that opportunity. They are done after a few films. It's very hard to make money. Mm. Uh, what do you think has been, maybe not the secret, but the, some of the key points in keeping, I mean, you both have, what, over 20 some directing credits? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's difficult. I mean, most people tap out after a few because it is so hard. I think it's, I think we probably both have interesting answers to this, but um, do you wanna go first? Well, I was gonna say that I think it makes a difference that there's two of us. I really do. I mean, it's a not lot. Not just one of us. <laughs> yeah, not just one of us. Because, um, you know, we, um, we can support each other and you don't wanna kind of, you, you have someone that you are accountable to in a lot of ways. Um, no one knows who does what. So it's like everyone has to kind of have their, their top, their, their game on. Um, and I think it's just, I, I see a lot of our good friends that are lone wolf filmmakers, and it's hard, it's very lonely. And um, you are creating something from the ether, and no one knows or cares about it until it's finished. And it's, it's tough, it's, it's, not, um, it's, not a so it's not for the soft hearted, I'd say, this particular, um, this job. So I think the fact that there's two of us and that we help each other out, I think that that has uh, sustained quite a bit. It's for the soft heart, but not the soft stomach. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, there's a t I think there's a type of documentary filmmaker that will spend nine years on a subject. There's an incredible devotion and obsession that most documentary filmmakers have. And I think it's hard to do have, have a body of work if you have spent eight years on a subject to get the motivation to do another one. I mean, I think if there's just a type of person that makes documentaries that might not be looking at their whole career trajectory at, at, the, at, the, at the whole you know, future career. Um, and we try to look at the body of work and look down the road. So I think that's helpful to us. Uh, but, you know, we, we do feature length documentary films that take two or three or more years to make, but we also do um, documentaries for television, um, you know, for, for other clients, which are, are very, you know, they, they can be satisfying and they're just shorter and maybe less in depth, but we also are doing those while we're making the, the other films. So it's really rare for us to just sort of peel off and not do anything else, the two of us, for a period of four years. We also have, we have other irons in the fire um, because you also have to make a living. And so we're careful about that balance between the larger feature-length documentaries, which are very precious to us, and also some of the short, shorter form um, pieces that are, are wonderful as well that maybe take less effort and less time and there's less shooting days and less editing so we we take that work as well and I think uh, you know we have to do that in order to uh, to make a living and also you know we like to to do things that have a shorter turnaround that are going to be brought to an audience sooner as well there's you know, keep your skills up you know you have to be able to do all kinds of work we do commercials every now and then so you know you want to keep your muscles going and if you're just in an edit room for 12 months and you're not in the field anymore guess what you can get rusty you can get rusty if you're not in the field a lot and your eye can get soft and I don't know I think it, it is something that has to be kept up and we're able to do that by, by doing television work as well as our feature length work. You have a scene in the beginning of the film or toward the beginning where Ari I believe is speaking to a rabbi and the rabbi is kind of like talking about human nature and how it's just part of our makeup to shun those in the sort of quote unquote out group. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a mammalian trait too. Animals mm -hmm. do it. Can you talk about that and your thoughts on that? I, um, that was a very tough scene for us to get. Um, it was uh, getting people that are in the community to go on camera speaking to our characters was extremely challenging. <clears throat> we 
happened to we we got that we got that scene that's pretty that's much it mm -hmm. um and i i'm glad you noticed it i think it's really important that we had it right up front to start talking about the phenomenon of the black sheep right up front and not as something pertaining to their community but as a universal concept because that's really what the theme of the film is um is about being an individual versus being part of a group and um, what what is more valuable and what do you get more out of and how different people get different things out of it and um, so that was that's sort of a key that's a key moment when um, of course being a black sheep in the Hasidic community is quite different than being a black sheep at you know your office party you know but there, they have things in common. There's correlation. The human behavior, there's correlation. So um, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that. And then we wanted it to be right up front so that it was already in your brain when you started watching the movie. And what this elder in the community says is there's group think. And that is human trait, group think. You know, you're shun, shun or be shunned. And as Rachel said, it's more extreme in this particular community, but I'm sure there's many people in the gay and trans community and the evangelical Christian community, doubters in that, in that world, that have felt shunned. And for them, it's their entire world. It might not be as extreme as the Hasidic community, but when you're living it, being cast out, I think there's a lot of people that can identify with those fears that are not religious people. And we hope that these kind of concepts can jump out of the Hasidic community and into sort of a, a more general discourse of people who see the movie. Once you approached Footsteps, how long before you had the three main characters in the film? How long did you ask them, would they be willing to? About a year, it took us about a year from when we first approached Footsteps until we met um, our three main characters. Um, because we filmed some other people before them. And for various reasons, we, we felt like we had not found our main characters yet. And when we filmed each one of our characters that ended up being sort of the stars of the film, we knew right away. So until you have that feeling like this person, this is the right person, you keep trying. And once we had them, we stopped looking.